a note of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast, bringing you high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm Owen Michael. Billy Jensen joins us remotely from his ongoing book tour in Seattle. Hello, Billy. Hello, it never ends. <laughs> it's September 12th, 2019 today, and Jasmine Kanick is our guest today. Jasmine is a journalist and a cultural critic, and she's covered the Ed Buck case in West Hollywood, California extensively, which is what we're going to talk about today. Welcome, Jasmine. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Uh, so we'll get into this uh, Ed Buck case, which uh, some of our viewers and listeners may have heard about. But uh, first of all, do you mind uh, t- telling us a little bit about yourself, what you're, what you're working on? Sure. So um, my background is by day, I, I work in politics. Mm-hmm. Um, my, I worked in Congress. I've worked in the legislature. I've worked for about five mayors. And uh, I still work in politics. But in my free time, I, uh, I'm still a journalist at heart. I used to anchor the news on the radio here in L.A. And I do a lot of television and radio commentating, particularly on um, politics, the intersection of politics and race and these pesky social issues that we seem to have popping up everywhere. Um, I love to talk about that, um, oftentimes from a black point of view, but oftentimes from a common sense point of view. Sure. Uh, I imagine there's nothing, there's not a, there's no shortage of stuff to talk about these days, which is good, right? I mean, this stuff is kind of, uh, we're we're chatting about this stuff, which uh, may have been under the rug in previous years, a little uncomfortable, but here we are. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of bad things you can say about social media and the evolution of technology and how we use it in, in, in media today. But one thing is for sure, word spreads quickly now. Like, you know, there's there's no reason for people not to know about something because we have so many different ways that we can get information. Mm-hmm. So I love it. Billy and I both have worked in the digital space uh, in journalism for a long time. So we're uh, and it just keeps getting faster and faster. Yeah. So uh, it's around the clock to uh, uh, it's quite a task staying informed and staying up on the latest these days. Um, so. We'll sort of get into the Ed Buck case here. Um, first of all, do you want to give us sort of the broad overview yeah. of, of what the, the, the two two situations in particular are and then the, the general thing? Sure. So um, back in July of 2017, Jamel Moore, uh, he was 26 years old. He died of a crystal meth overdose at Ed Buck's house. Ed Buck lives in this two-bedroom apartment in West Hollywood. Uh, He's a major Democratic uh, donor. And I say that because, one, I am very active in the Democratic Party, and I don't like this, but he's given over half a million dollars to um, politicians here in California, particularly in L.A. County. He, um, When Jamel died, it it was seen by the sheriffs as, oh, this is just another meth overdose. Um, They have a lot of overdoses in L.A. County, but particularly in West Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so here you have this, you know, white man, 65 years old with this 26 year old black man who's dead on his floor in his living room, just saying, oh, I don't know how he ended up doing drugs. I don't know anything about that. So they basically labeled it. Not basically. They did. They labeled it an accidental overdose and closed the case. The L.A. County. LA County County. coroners. Mm -hmm. Right. So what happened is that Jamel had some personal things with him while he was at Ed Buck's house. Ed Buck had flown him here um, uh, not even 24 hours before he died, had flown him here from Houston, Texas. He wasn't even here a whole day and he was dead. And um, in those personal effects was a diary. And in that diary, he had been documenting for quite some time his relationship with Ed Buck. And some of the things he talked about was how Ed Buck was the first person to ever give him meth, was forcing him to use meth, had got him hooked on meth. Uh, He felt very low. um, And it's just really, really sad. And I got permission from his mother to publish the the excerpts from his from his uh, journal And after that, 19 days later, the sheriff's department opened a homicide investigation. That's the only reason why they opened it, because they looked really bad. I published it on my on. uh, I have a pretty big following online. I published it on my website. And then from there, um, you know, the L.A. Times, everybody's, you know, sort of picked up the story. Mm -hmm. Um, 
what was really interesting about that was that out of the blue, not really out of the blue, but all of a sudden I had all these young men contacting me saying, hey, I need to talk to you. I know this guy, Ed Bug. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that that these young men did. And, and I I met with them late at night, all kinds of different places on their terms. Um, and they had photos and videos and um, text messages and screenshots and voicemails. I mean, and what what the pattern that emerged was that Ed Buck is a man who is openly gay, but also likes to use the internet, online dating sites to pick up uh, young black gay men to come to his house, and he pays them to do drugs. And the more drugs they do, the more money they can make. And Uh, There are some other nefarious dealings that go on as well. He looks for a particular type of young man, homeless or down on their luck, needing money, needing shelter. Um, He uses his wealth. He uses um, his privilege. Kind of a power relationship. Yeah, to, to take advantage of these young men. And I started writing about it one after another after another. Um, I never used the young men's names. I never outed them. And even in the photos that they gave me, if they were in those photos, I would blur their face out Mm -hmm. so people wouldn't know who they were because I wasn't trying to victimize them a second time, right? And the pattern became really, really clear. Well, in July of last year, District Attorney Jackie Lacey decided that there was not enough admissible evidence to file any any criminal charges. Now, let me tell you something. When Ed, when Jamel Moore died, there were so many drugs in Ed Buck's apartment. It was like a smorgasbord between the heroin and the cocaine and the meth and the needles and the this. But, you know, in California, we've trained, we've changed our drug paraphernalia use and possession laws to the point where they're not felonies anymore, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, and also in California, do we not um, have the Len Bias law? We probably do. I don't know as much about that, but I know we also we have the drug dealer liability, which I don't mm-hmm. know if you're familiar with that one. Um, but we have, last time I checked, meth was an illegal drug. Last time I checked, mm-hmm. so was heroin and cocaine. Definitely. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Billy, would you explain uh, the, the yeah. Len Bias yeah. law? Well, for- the Len Bias law, you know, Len, Len Bias was a, uh, a first-round draft pick for the Celtics. He went out, he partied with cocaine uh, right after he got drafted, and he died. And the Len Bias law states that if you provided drugs to that person, that person right. dies, you could be liable, not for murder, but for, um, you, you're responsible criminally for their death. And I know that there's, uh, you know, th- this case has shades of a case that I've been working on up in uh, in Humboldt County, where a guy has had people OD at his house. He's also potentially responsible for a couple murders as well. And the police can't do anything about it. And I asked them, you know, can we use the Len Bias law because it has been used at other people? But they said, no, we can't. So I always bring up the Len Bias law because it has been used in the past. But um, that's that seems the like drug dealer liability law. Seems common sense. Yes. Right. And 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 actually, if you you guys are familiar with the whole Mac Miller case. Right. Mm-hmm. And what happened last week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just yes. Happened. Right. So the uh, federal federal law enforcement uh, has no problem going right. after people for drugs. We it's should say this is, this is the rapper who died of a drug overdose yes. last year. Right. Yes. Uh, and then just last week, uh, they announced charges that they were going after the dealer who gave him yes. bad drugs. I think it was. It was. Yes. There was fentanyl mixed in right. with. The right. oxy. So, right. but yeah, so Jackie Lacey comes back and says, you know, our no, attorney, our district County. attorney says no charges on for anything. Now, you know, I was hoping for, oh, can we get a, you know, some degree of murder? Maybe I'd even take a manslaughter, right? We couldn't get anything. And I remember having this press conference in front of the West Hollywood Sheriff's Department. Um, we were responding to her decision. And I remember saying, that it wasn't a matter of if it was a matter of when the next person dies, mm-hmm. that 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 their blood was going to be on the sheriff's and the district attorney's hands. And sure enough, on January 7th of this year, 55, six months later, 55 mm-hmm. year old Timothy Dean was dead on the same mattress, on the same floor, in the same apartment same of the same causes. Mm-hmm. 
Um, wow. And so that's where we are right now. We have, um, we're waiting, <laughs> you know, we're we, young men are all the time reaching out to me. He, um, I've, I've had to do so much. I, uh, I had to make a fake profile on one of the dating websites so I can track him. I mean, these are the things you go through, right? You know, when you're really, you know, I, you know, I feel like I need to be on the payroll at the sheriff's department. Uh, he's still online uh, soliciting people. He does it online. He does it. Uh, we've been told he goes to Skid Row. He picks up folks off of Santa Monica Boulevard. Um, and, you know, we're waiting for the sheriff's department to build a case that the DA's office can will move forward on. So we're in this holding pattern. So a- after Jamel's death, the, the L.A. County investigation lasted almost a year before they came out and said, nothing we can't do anything one day before the one year yeah so uh, essentially they said it was a he said he said they had no way to i was surprised that they couldn't even get to sort of a drug possession or anything like that i mean the stuff was all in california but it took a year for them to figure out that they couldn't charge him does that seem uh, does that indicate that's normal yeah i mean usually what happens in la county with our district attorneys is they wait usually till right before the anniversary. So if you think about Mac Miller, they did the same sure. thing. They announced these charges right before the one-year anniversary. Mm. Mm-hmm. The one-year anniversary was over the weekend, and they announced the charges, what, on, on Wednesday or Thursday mm-hmm. of, of oh, last, last week? week. Right, yeah. right, right. Um, and then have you, have you been able to ascertain how Jamel and Ed first came into contact with him? Uh, together yeah i mean like i said he he looks for vulnerable young men men who are like i said in need um they some of them are sex workers um, they do survival sex they're they're homeless or they're um they're uh, in need of shelter in some way um he knows his his target like he picks people like he couldn't do that with me or you Mm -hmm. but he knows that there is a population of young black gay men on the streets in west hollywood and Mm -hmm. in la who need food who need money sure and it's you know one of the questions i get asked the most and it really bothers me is people will say well why are they doing that? Why are they, you know, especially after the two deaths, you know, and we know that there have been young men that have gone over there since, right? And people say, well, if they know, why are they going? And it's like, well, you don't know what you'd do if you were hungry or right. if you needed shelter or if you need to take a shower or or you were or an addict, you know? Plus mm-hmm. you're victim blaming there, uh, even potential. I mean, you know, the, the point is don't commit crime so you know whether you're going over to this guy's house or not it's uh, it's incumbent upon him to not to uh, do any alleged uh, no one agrees crimes. to get killed when they go to Ed Buck's house no matter what they agree to I can pretty much guarantee no one is agreeing to die or to be yeah I'm sorry go ahead Billy yeah can you can you see his do you know what his ads are like can you look online right now and see that he has an ad on craigslist oh, or something like I, that i haven't been online recently but i have a whole bunch of his ads on my computer because you know i'm good at screenshotting and you know what i have to give it up to the folks um in california in la who just want to see justice because they send it to me they'll mm-hmm. you know because see I don't frequent certain websites because I'm a lesbian woman. I'm not a gay man. So, but they do. And when they're on there perusing and they see an Ed Buck ad, they'll be like, oh, let me send this to Jasmine yeah. and let let her know how he's they, on here. How do they know it's an Ed Buck ad, though? Well, he's, he, this is a man who is not ashamed at all. He will post his photo. He will make oh, wow. it clear who he is. He is not. When this first happened with Jamel Moore, his screen name on the this website was Buck Ed. <laughs> it, that bucked. It was that was his screen name. How did Jamel end up in? Uh, so is he originally from Houston? <laughs> Jamel is from L.A. He's from L.A., but he was out Jamel in Houston. Jamel had went home to Houston to try to get his life together, and mm-hmm. Ed Bug got him back here. They had a previous relationship, yes. I see. Yeah. And like I said, within 24 hours of him landing here at LAX, he was dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, and since then, the family has filed a civil lawsuit against right. Ed Buck 
uh, this is Jamel, uh, Jamel Moore's family, uh, yes. has filed a civil lawsuit against Ed Buck as well as L.A. County uh, District Attorney Jackie Lacey. Yes, and Assistant uh, uh, de- uh, uh, Deputy Craig Hum. Okay. And um, the thinking here is, and I support this 100%, is that we got to get justice somewhere. Um, you know, probably not the best example, but one that comes to mind is O.J. Simpson. Right. So O.J. Simpson was acquitted, but the family still sued him and prevailed in civil court. Right. So we've seen it happen before. That's sort of the landmark uh, or a landmark way to go about it. Yeah. Uh, Well, here's another landmark way. You know, I've been saying, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Phil Spector. mm -hmm. You remember all those? Remember how he was finally convicted? He was finally convicted because they used the compiled testimonies of the other women who had been there and witnessed that same behavior. Mm -hmm. They need to do that in this case as well. Two men are dead. Mm -hmm. They can't speak for themselves. But we have so many young men who have their receipts. You know, they have in in some cases, I mean, literally, he paid them on Venmo or Zelly. Like they have receipts. The whole electronic trail is there. I mean, from the pictures to the videos. And but again, we don't when we talk about survivors, when we talk about victims, we don't think of black gay men. We don't think of a lot of times we don't think of men, period. Right. And so it's been an uphill battle working with law enforcement, also even working with the media to get them to understand how to approach this. Right. These men aren't they're They are victims. They are, you know, they're. They're out there for whatever reason trying to take care of themselves. Um, in some cases, like with Jamel, he wasn't even on crystal meth. That wasn't even a thing for him until Ed Buck did that. To in fact, him. in his journal, he's he talked specifically it. about uh, how he introduced it. He, he says, injected him specifically. Yes. Ed Buck is the guy that did this in, this, did. in the journal entry. Um, so, I got a question. Do any of the individuals? Um, who have been to his house, who have been really victimized by him, are any of them unwilling to go on the record, unwilling to go public, unwilling to to testify because it it might out them? So here's the thing. One sadly passed away from complications due to AIDS last year. And that just really broke my heart because he was such a, he was a really sweet young man. Um, A couple of the others have kind of moved in a different direction with their life and they're trying to do better and they don't want to look back. Mm -hmm. Um, I've gotten a significant number of them to meet with the sheriffs and give uh, give testimony. Right. Um, Working with the legal team we put together, we were able to get them limited immunity because they're still black men. They go in there talking about doing drugs. They might end up in in men's, you know, uh, men's central county jail. So we had to Mm -hmm. make sure that they had immunity. So the sheriffs didn't pull that on them. Um, But they they have we have brought a significant number of young men to the I have literally myself had to pick them up and drive them and bring them there and sit there. So I know that they've done their interviews because they no one's running to try to talk to the sheriffs, especially a sheriff's department that they see as being friends with Ed Buck. Mm Because one of Ed Buck's big things is when he's done with you. And you or you piss him off or you don't do what he wants you to do. He calls the sheriffs on you and the sheriffs come and remove you from his house. Like that's a big thing with him. He does that all the time. He did it yesterday to a young man. And, you know, like I said, team justice is really big. So neighbors calling, hey, girl, get over here. You know, Mm -hmm. and sure enough, he had called the sheriffs on a young black man he had at his house. The sheriffs came and did his dirty work for him and escorted him out of the building and then I guess it dawned on them, wait a minute, this is Ed Buck's house. Because they came back and they're driving up and down the street. Have you seen a black man walking? We're looking for an African-American man. They were literally trying to find him yesterday afternoon. Now, I don't know if they were trying to find him to interview him. I don't know if they were trying to find him because Ed Buck turned around and said he stole something. And now Ed Buck wants to press charges. But they let him go without interviewing him or anything and then we're looking for him i also was looking for him i actually spent about two to three hours yesterday driving around west hollywood trying to find him myself with another person um because we we understand the 
the significance of that. We've been saying all along that he never stopped, right? There, there's this one news video um, that breaks my heart when they were taking Jamel Moore's body out, and there's another young black man headed right up the stairs, and the sheriffs have to tell him, you can't go up here. That very night, that same night that Jamel Moore died, Ed Buck had called for another young black man to come over. And, and there's an image online and you see the coroners at the top of the stairs taking the body out. And you see the young man at the bottom of the stairs with the sheriff's tell, basically telling him, you can't, you can't come upstairs. That's how, how that is Ed Buck. Mm-hmm. He, he has, he doesn't care. Uh, his mouthpiece in the media. Um, I'm sure you guys remember this case, the Grim Sleeper. Of course. Mm-hmm. Okay, Franklin. that's yeah. his attorney, Seymour Amster, who's said uh, he said a couple of incendiary things uh, oh. about this case. I mean, he said uh, something to the effect that uh, said the words race war, uh, which is you know I only hear that from. Uh, a certain segment of uh, white men, in fact. Um, uh, but let me pause you right there. I know where you're going with that. I just want to let you know he's an active member of the L.A. County Democratic Party. Uh, the the attorney is. Yes. Uh-huh. I have to see him at every county party meeting. So this is sort of informing your, I mean, <laughs> this is a story any way you, you slice it, but then on top of that, you've got these active members of the of the California Democratic Party of which you are a part, and so that's a little insult to injury, and hence your. Yeah, uh, basically, Seymour Amster has done Ed Buck's bidding, and I, I don't blame him. He's getting paid good money to do it, but here here are the arguments. They brought the drugs here. They, oh, he was acting crazy and he tied a noose around his neck and he was trying to hang himself. So I went and took a shower. And when I came out of the shower, he was unresponsive. And I waited 15 minutes, but I called 911 15 minutes later. Right. And the, and the Timothy Dean one, uh, he specifically tells paramedics that he had been giving CPR and, and, and the thing. but uh, That he had been acting crazy and had put a noose around his neck. If somebody was doing that in your living room, would you get up and go take a shower or leave that person alone? I No, okay. I wouldn't. I, I definitely I couldn't uh, yes. say that I would. But yes. um, so part of this. I would speculate is, as you say, these are uh, less affluent African-American men uh, who are some of them are, uh, you know, adjacent to the streets and have drug problems and things like that. It's not as it doesn't make the news. uh, It doesn't make as high profile if you're talking about another segment or demographic of society. Look. These men are still a part of the rainbow, the alphabet soup. They're a part of the LGBTQIA, whatever other letters sure. they have added community. Their lives matter, you know, particularly for progressive liberal folks who are always, hot, you know, want to say, oh, black lives matter. Well, then all black lives matter, not sure. some black lives matter. And even if you don't feel that way, at the end of the day, something ain't right here. Like lightning does not hit in the same exact place twice. All right. There's something not right. I mean, the man's neighbors got together and tried to get him evicted out of the apartment. He lives in a rent control apartment. West Hollywood's rent controlled. And he's been there over 20 years. So, you know, he's paying like little to nothing to live there. But again, laws, he hasn't technically broken any laws. There's nothing the landlord can do. Do you think uh, that the district attorney's office was sort of doing this? sort of going through the motions as they would with uh, any generic drug overdose story, not to not to be too blunt about it. Or do you think that this is some little kind of look on the way, look on the other way? Or is it just basically that this is demographic that isn't uh, reported on as much? And so it's sort of just kind of kind of drifted away and nobody really chased after it until uh, you and, and, and your crew kind of uh, are keeping this in, uh, keeping this afloat? I think it's a little bit of both. I think there's uh, a lack of political will in the, in the DA's office. As you know, district attorneys like to prosecute cases they can win. Sure. They they really only take on cases that they think that they can win. Right. And so I think that's very problematic because that's not how we should be looking at getting justice for families and people. It shouldn't be on the basis of whether or not you can win in the courtroom. Second, I do believe it has to do with the fact that they are black and they are gay and they're sex workers and they are poor and they are, for the most part, voiceless, right? 
Um, but that doesn't mean that that their lives don't matter and that they don't deserve justice. Right, of course not. And I don't want to see a third person die there. Like every day, I'm like, please, well, you know, it's how prescient was that when you were saying that basically two days after the after the district attorney declined yeah. to prosecute the first time, and you hit the nail on the head as far as uh, that goes. Also, it should be said that West Hollywood. Uh, which is a, a, a kind of a known gay neighborhood in, or I should say city. It's a city within Los Angeles in, this, in the city here is widely known as progressive and uh, socially. Wealthy, and the whole thing. progressive, and, right. and liberal. So you would, this is kind of, uh, it's kind of incongruent with what you would think. Yeah. What happened? There. I mean, they're the ones that took, took away Trump's uh, star. Yeah. Mm hmm. On Hollywood Boulevard, you know, so they're, you know, they're very much, you know, I think this has a lot to do with race. It also has a lot to do with, with power and what friends this guy may have, he, um, yeah. you know. He, he, um, with the exception of one council member, has given significant amounts of money to the, the people who are on the, the current city council. He ran for city council himself in West Hollywood. Uh, he's very well known um, in West Hollywood, you know, but this, you know, this isn't a West Hollywood city council issue. This is an issue of political will for our sheriff's department. I mean, this is a sheriff's department that when interviewing these young men called them illegal male prostitutes and huh. could not understand why one of the people was so offended and did not want to talk to him, this is this detective ever again. And I remember going on uh, Twitter and saying, where is Olivia Benson from SVU when you need her? Like, I need some tutuola. Like, get me my SVU, <laughs> my law and order, because we need some sensitivity here. This is not how you would talk to white women who come to you and say, uh, some film director or someone has sexually harassed or or hurt them. This is not even how you would talk to female sex workers. Why are we doing this to them? Why are we belittling them, making them feel bad and less than? They already feel that way. What yeah. What do you expect? Uh, what What's sort of? How do you think this is going to play out in the next couple of weeks? Do you think that? You've got Jackie Lacey's attention uh, and that they are sort of behind the scenes kind of scrambling and saying, maybe we can make something work here. Or do you think that uh, – what are your thoughts on that? I don't want to lead you there. I did meet with Jackie Lacey. Uh -huh. uh, and um, have I have – I have – I believe that she cares about what is going on. I'm also aware that she's up for re-election. Mm -hmm. So I'm mindful of how – as someone who, who's a strategist and works in politics, I'm mindful of how all of these things play out. You know, technically, they probably will take up until January 6th to make their decision. They usually wait a day before the sure. one year. But what I'm what I'm sure of is that we're going to continue on. And as many times as it takes to put it in, in the sheriff's faces, because I don't live in West Hollywood. I used to back in the day. I don't live there anymore. Um, very little black people do. Um but there are people on that block who are watching and I'm grateful for them because they make sure that we know what we need to know to prove that this behavior hasn't stopped. And so the criminal side may be stalling, trying to figure it out, but the civil side will keep moving. Federal court, as you know, moves a lot faster than state court. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful for that. I know that Timothy Dean's family is um, weighing their options right now on also filing um, a wrongful death lawsuit against the county and and Ed Buck. So we're just gonna keep we're just gonna keep working on it. You know, what's the strategy of <clears throat> so if you're filing a, a wrongful death lawsuit and you're targeting uh, Ed Buck, the the place and the time and the circumstances where this happened, what's the strategy including the uh, of including the district attorney's office? You're essentially, not you, but the mm -hmm. the lawsuit is essentially accusing or suggesting that they are a part of why this isn't happening. I mean, does it make more sense to not include them, or is this sort of a you you hook them in so that you definitely get their attention on this? No, I mean, there's a strategy. I, I wanted to look it up to so I could use the exact words, mm -hmm. right? So. The best way to explain this in terms of Jamel Moore is that th we're alleging that the district attorney's office um, 
was discriminatory in its decision not to prosecute Ed Buck. I see. Um, and we're also saying that because of that, Timothy Dean is dead. Had Ed Buck been prosecuted last year, chances are Ed Buck might not have been around right. for Timothy Dean to have died on January 7th. And um, there are some other things going on I, that I really am not at liberty to talk about in terms of the county's liability. But there's a reason why the county is also being called um, – on the, in this lawsuit. Ed Buck is obvious. One of the things I'm really happy about with the with Ed Buck is that the judge um, of all, we had several causes of action when it came to Ed Buck, and only one the judge asked to be amended, which was um, drug dealer liability, which will make the, the, the amendments. Um, the judge kind of laid out sort of what he wanted to see um, uh, in terms of the amendments. Nothing on the human trafficking, which is a big win for us. There are, um, this is one of the first cases, federal cases, that is um, for this type of case that has included a cause of action that is human trafficking. You're seeing that with the Jeffrey Epstein, uh, the Jeffrey Epstein estate case. You're mm-hmm. seeing that with Harvey Weinstein. So it's going to be a lot of folks paying attention to this, particularly survivors and people who represent survivors, to see how this plays out in court. So my question is uh, trafficking versus prostitution. Uh, like you said, this is uh, an issue in Epstein and Weinstein, which, God bless, it's tragic circumstances, but it's so high profile now and it, it, it is these things. What do you see, how do you see that distinction as human trafficking versus just prostitution? Well, in several cases, or soliciting, I should say. Yeah, soliciting well, in several cases, there, there are a couple of things. So in several of these instances, Jamel Moore is not the only young man that Ed Buck flew into town mm. and brought from another state here to engage in certain behavior. So there's that angle there's the physically yes uh, facilitating someone yes. to, to to move yes right and then several of the young men have testified to and and I've also written about the fact that he will take them to places like Skid Row and Santa Monica Boulevard and have them find other young men for him like so there are so many different layers to all of this um, it sounds very predatory. It is very predatory, and um, I'm confident in the legal team, the two attorneys, Hussein Turk and Nana Jumfi, that I think if it, if and when it makes it to, it could, it could obviously settle, but if it makes it um, through trial, that a, a jury will <laughs> will agree with us that mm-hmm. this ain't right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's something wrong here. It does not pass the smell test. You mentioned uh, Team Justice. Uh, oh, I just made that. That was just. Yeah. Is that a hashtag somewhere? No, I'm it sure like it is somewhere. Be. I just call it Team Justice, but it's justice for Jamal and all of Ed Buck's victims. Right, and yeah. so you you have a uh, uh, online presence on this. Is there a place that uh, you'd like to tell our viewers or, or listeners? Yeah, they can go to Justice for Jamal dot org, and it's the number four in G E M M E L. And then my website is iamjasmine.com, very simple. And we'll include links, of course, yeah. uh, to that and all of our uh, uh, online stuff here for the uh, for the podcast as well as the, the YouTube thing there. Um, so, yeah, we'll definitely keep the, you, the viewers and listeners updated as this, uh, as this goes on. Thanks for chatting about this one. Okay, for now, uh, we're actually going to stick around in California. News outlets in Southern California report that Bruce Beresford Redman has returned home to Southern California. He served time in Mexican prison for murdering his wife and reportedly released about two months ago, but the news of his release surfaced this week. He was convicted in 2015 in Mexico City of murdering his wife at a Cancun resort in 2010, and he was sentenced to 12 years in prison. And he had been serving time in the Mexican state of Quintana Roo on the Yucatan Peninsula, where Cancun is located uh, along the Caribbean. So Beresfim Beresford Redman was released from prison. Uh, he served only four years. He was credited with seven and a half years uh, for time served, which was the stuff that was leading up to his conviction. He was also fined about $3,000, 43,000 pesos. He's accused of killing his wife in an argument in their hotel room uh, with their two kids in the room next door. Um, I guess he's actually, he was convicted of, of, of killing right. her, correct? Right. Yeah. Um, other hotel guests heard screaming coming from their room. 
the kids who were five and seven at the time were at the resort to celebrate his wife, Monica's 42nd birthday. And Monica Burgos was found um, on the resort property the next day in a septic tank. She had been beaten and suffocated. Blood was found in the room. And Bruce also had scratches on his face and arms. And he was also discovered to have been having an ongoing extramarital affair. Beresford Redman was a TV producer. He worked on Survivor and the show Pimp My Ride, among other reality shows. And after her body was discovered, he immediately came back to California and there was intense media scrutiny. His wife's sister was a frequent presence on media, urging for his arrest and conviction. He was held in jail for L.A. for months, then extradited back to Mexico in 2012, where he was convicted in 2015. But right now he's out and he is free. This was quite the story when this broke uh, back in uh, 2012, uh, 2012, 2010 when this happened. Um, he sort of absconded from Mexico right away. Uh, I think he knew it was up, got back here, and everybody in town sort of uh, kind of knew what was going on. And it was some wide criticism of it. It had scratches on him and the, and the whole thing. He managed to he managed to sort of lawyer up. It wasn't sure whether they were going to extradite him. Eventually they did. I'm struck with the fact that uh, basically he got out in four years. I mean, you hear stuff like this in, in our system here in the United States, time served and, and, and percentages taken off due to overcrowding and things like that. And yeah. But uh, only 12 years for the violent murder and uh, uh, of your wife and disposing her body and that kind of stuff seems... No. It seems a little... It's wrong. It seems it's a little enough. light. It's light. It's exactly. Line, it's and wrong. then basically, I mean, I wouldn't wish prison on anyone, but being in prison for four years uh now it sounds like this guy should have been doing a lot more time it's it's well, i'm gonna go ahead it kind of boggles it. the mind a little bit well one you know one could argue it was a mexican prison so do we say that's really eight years sure. typically those prisons are harder than right do we give them you know do we give credit for that um i definitely think that's i mean for me what is a life worth right and when i look at that i'm like that doesn't seem right but it's mexico it's not america right right and so we you know unless we're getting ready to, unless our justice system is gonna figure out and look far be it from beyond they might i don't know they could always figure something out um it wouldn't be the first time i mean the man's a free man he's gonna be able to live his life i just don't think he's gonna live his life in in sort of the shadows and the peace and quietness that he probably was having in Gardena. Now that everybody knows he's in Gardena, he's probably going to have to move somewhere else. Yeah. Right. It's a bit of and a let's see right. who's going to hire him as a producer I for think that reality stuff is, TV shows. Yeah. Oh, Although it's reality TV, you never know who they will hire. He may end up being the show. There you go. Yeah. This is Hollywood. Come on. Yeah. They'll do, yeah. yeah. You could shop a book or something along those lines. Yeah. TV, um, film. Oh, that was, that was in 2010. It's fine now. Yeah. Well, and you know, That's he's, probably what they will say. And uh, yeah, you never put anything past Hollywood to put anybody on television, including a guy that killed his wife with his kids next door. I mean, I feel bad for these kids. Um, you know, they were five and seven at the time. So, um, you know, they're teenagers now. Uh, can't, you know, can't help but think what's going through their heads. Yes, indeed. Well, so uh, if I wanted to bring you that story just to, for a little resolution to that one. It was such a high profile one. And I'm uh, frankly a yeah. astonished at the at the result. But uh, we shall see. Um, Billy, why don't you tell us about the comments uh, that we well, get? Well, you uh, know what? We get comments and we got some comments, a lot of comments on um, uh, this particular story. This hurts. North Carolina woman charged with castrating husband. She was a Newport woman. Victoria Freybutt is charged with malicious castration. Sheriff's Major Jason Wank, I'm not making that up, says the removed body part was put on ice after being recovered. I can't make up those names. I cannot make up these comments from our listeners. Diana D. said another Lorena Bobbitt or throw her in prison with Chris Watts and a steak dinner. Chris Watts, of course, who... Uh, uh, uh convicted of killing his wife and two daughters uh, in Colorado and burying their bodies in an oil field where he worked. Uh, awful human being in good company there. Go ahead. That's right. Um, John K. said divorce would be a better choice. And Ramona M. said, the moral of the story, don't piss grandmama off. She don't play. The story didn't elaborate on why. 
uh, this happened. I frankly am surprised that we don't hear this particular assault happening uh, daily uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) across the country. It seems like... uh, you know, thinking of the Lorena Bobbitt's obviously the, the, if you don't know this story, kids, uh, way back when there was a, a man who beat his wife and she uh, had enough and waited until he was sleeping and took a kitchen knife and removed his member and drove away and threw it out the window into uh, basically into a ditch and they, they found it later. And um, I honestly, I, I'm surprised that this doesn't yeah. happen more hey, often. Hey, you know what? Speaking yeah. of reality TV shows, she actually got it. I mean, she didn't get a reality TV show, but she got a documentary and her face was on. You recall what, was, what he did. He yeah. uh, oh. actually went into the adult film business there briefly. He did, yes. So, he did briefly. And he was on uh, some Howard Stern specials, too. Unsavory. Mm-hmm. Unsavory characters. So uh, we've got the Connecticut woman arrested on DUI charges. She was arrested twice in one day. Mm. Ellen Needleman O'Neill was arrested about 2.30 p.m. Uh, last week after police said she crashed into a parked car. She was later found to have a blood alcohol content of 0.2261, which is very high. Police say she had uh, Tylenol, codeine, Tylenol codeine pills in her purse. About six hours later, police received a call reporting that she was at a liquor store to buy alcohol and drove away in the same car. She, they caught up with her, arrested her again found that she had 0.0928, so she had, uh, it had diluted in her system a little bit, but she uh, apparently was on her way to get more booze. Uh, nothing nothing to make light of, but um, it's pretty amazing that, uh, yeah. you know, it's a sort of addictive behavior there. Our comments, Lisa S. said, anyone arrested on any form of DUI should be charged with attempted murder! Exclamation point. Think about that. Precious W said, why was she let out so quickly the first time? Luckily, she didn't kill anyone. I think the police department should be held accountable for the second incident. And certainly if she would have hurt somebody, that would have been um, that it would have been a much bigger story. And uh, Tyler B said, thank God she didn't kill herself uh, or no one else. That's the first time I've heard anybody propose something like attempted murder for a DUI. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if I would go that far, but I think that that's... uh, not outside the realm of possibility, really uh-huh. cracking down on this stuff. I mean, some of us of a certain age, uh, Billy, I'm looking at you. Uh, I remember <clears throat> when my dad and his friends and in, in, in the early 80s, it was not a really big deal. It wasn't in the 70s. They really kind of came and cracked down at the national federal level uh, uh, against DUIs. Mid, mid-80s, Seems I to think, have yeah. had a pretty yeah. good uh, result, but I think we've sort of leveled off and there's a certain amount of DUI activity that, uh, some people are not deterred. Well, there's, there's also, there's so much uh, addiction now and there's also, you know, and what law enforcement is trying to grapple with is how they're going to test for driving while under the influence of marijuana, because now that marijuana is legal in so many States, um, how are they going to deal with that? So um, I don't think it's just marijuana. They need to also figure out how we're going to deal with the opiates and with opiates too. So we have a lot, particularly in Los Angeles, that's a real big deal. Like Mm -hmm. people driving, under the influence of all kinds of stuff. Sure, yeah. and even in uh, you know Appalachia in the South yeah. in, in 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 the Midwest, the, the opioid crisis—it's a crisis, and we've had a little, uh, we've had some stuff in the headlines this week about that. But it's true; this is now a, a larger thing, and um, you may have some of these drugs still in your system, even though you haven't done them for 24 hours or something. May yeah. still be affecting you, but how do you state by state? They're still figuring that out, and I haven't seen anybody that's really gotten it right yet as far as what's a good formula to how how do you ascertain this kind of stuff so it's all kinds of problematic and then you've just got the throwback here we just straight up want the booze Mm -hmm. we just have to give blood before the car can start yeah you know okay prick the finger prick the finger (laughs) let it read it okay you're on your way and you know if we had a if we had a reliable train and a bus everywhere in town here in particular yeah uh, you know i would never drive again it's just hit the bar mm-hmm. i'm whatever. with you on that but yeah. we don't exactly yeah We're not doing it we do not <laughs> well jasmine canick thank you for being with us this week quite enjoyed uh, chatting about this uh, case and we wish you the best on, on, thank on you. this going forward um we talked a little bit about uh, where they can find it it's uh, i am jasmine.com yes. right and uh justice for jamel.org so that's for the the letter excuse the, me the numeral four and jamel g-e-m-m-e-l yes. dot org and we will have those links up for you as well Thanks. check out our content on truecrimedaily.com and on facebook subscribe to us on youtube and don't forget to f- download our weekly podcast on stitcher itunes spotify 
Spotify or Google Play. If you have comments or questions about the show, we'd love to hear from you. Call us up, leave a message at 888-548-9758. And we may run your comment on the air in a future podcast. Until next week, this is True Crime Daily, the podcast reminding you. Don't do crimes. Yeah. See you next week. Yeah.